parking floor, so to say. From adapters to tents. From vacuums to body scrubs, virtually anything you might need is on Amazon. With such success worldwide and a big wallet to enter new markets, you would expect Amazon to dominate the Dutch online retail market. But that has not been the case, as in the Netherlands, Bol is still leading. With a surge in delivery services leading to a substantial increase in wasteful consumption, what measures is Amazon taking to achieve sustainability goals both in the EU and worldwide? To discuss these topics and more, we have with us the Chief Commercial Officer of Amazon Benelux, Michel Godery. Michel has had an extensive career in the retail sector, from Unilever to <laughs> sorry, from Unilever to Autoles, from Blocker to Amazon. Uh, she's worked in them all. Now, without further ado, please let us welcome the CCO of Amazon Benelux, Michel Godery. <laughs> So, welcome to Room for Discussion, Michelle. Yes. Um, our interview today coincides with a broader event at the university currently, Career Week, where various companies and representatives are sharing insights into their organizations. And in this context, we were wondering, could you maybe share your journey into how you came to be the CCO of Amazon Benelux? Yes, well, that's, I could take the entire hour for that now. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, I started um, with a study economics in the Utrecht University. Um, and during that study, I already did an internship at Unilever. And that's, I think, when I sort of started to realize that I really uh, like to work with products, consumers, and, 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 and yeah, really the FMCG business, what it's called. Um, and um, yeah, and then after that, I finished my thesis and I started to look for a job. Um, and uh, there, I, I found this really nice uh, traineeship at uh, Al Delaz. You probably know Albert Hein for your <laughs> grocery shopping, but also Bol.com is, is part of the larger group. Um, and uh, yeah, there I. Um, I did uh, a traineeship, uh, learned a lot of, uh, about retail, um, and um, within AOLT I did a couple of different roles, uh, where each time I sort of yeah, really followed what was I'm doing, what did I like, what do I want to learn next. Uh, and uh, it was a very nice atmosphere because I started with a group of um, yeah, a lot of young people, so we went out every Thursday evening and our manager was fine with that as long as we showed up on Friday morning. <laughs> so that was really, uh, yeah, nice time. Then um, I switched to um, uh, more the operations side within AO Deleuze, where I learned a lot about the logistic processes, but also how to run a store efficiently. Um, then um, I wanted to have a bit more impact on really the let's say, the commercial side of, of Ehold, um, uh, Albert Hein. Uh, and uh, I worked for um, the non-food business at Albert Hein, so the, uh, where I also connected with colleagues from Bol.com, uh, because they, of course, were uh, the, yeah, the non-food players there. Uh, then um, I decided with my husband that we would love to uh, spend some time abroad. And uh, back then, for Ehold, we could go to... Um, uh, the US or to um, uh, Prague in, in, uh, and then we uh, decided um, well that was not that easy for my husband because he was uh, working as an um, uh, ENT surgeon and that's not that easy if you to go to the US. Uh, so for his work we then went to Australia um, and uh, where he did a fellowship in school based surgery and I took a career break, um, and then I had sort of had to decide, like, okay, what's next? What do I want to do? Uh, and then I came back to the Netherlands, and actually Blocker back then was in a very bad situation because they were almost uh, bankrupt. Uh, so colleagues from Ehold who worked at Blocker reached out to me if I wanted to uh, work, uh, join them uh, to make Blocker a success again. Uh, and I had there, uh, uh, worked there for three years and did uh, many different projects trying to uh, improve the assortment, uh, the repositioning of the brand. Um, traveled a lot to China and India to uh, launch private label. Um, but it was also a very uh, 
let's say, a bit of a roller coaster. So at a certain period, I thought like, well, time for something new. Uh, and then I reached out to the country manager of Amazon because I heard that they were launching a store and I just sent him a message on LinkedIn. And actually he replied immediately and said, oh, I, I would like to have a, a conversation with you. And that's how I ended up there. <laughs> so it's a long story, but I hope it's, I forgot a lot, but I think at least it tells you a little bit about my career journey. So lots of experience and LinkedIn is an effective tool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it is. is. It is. So you mentioned you worked at uh, Blocker before. Um, was Amazon on your radar as like a threat or a competition to you guys at Blocker? Uh, well, back then when I worked for Blocker, um, my main focus was really on their uh, physical stores because back then it was still like 90% of the, of the revenue. Uh, but of course, also we looked at, at online and especially personally, I was very much like we should invest there, but not everyone shared that opinion. Um, and uh, we actually back then, I think our main competitor we looked at was probably MediaMark, Bold.com, Hema, because they are a bit more in, in that field. And Amazon was then not yet present, so it was, uh, yeah. But we knew, of course, that at a certain point they, they would come. So how does it feel being on the other side now? Um, yeah, well, I must say that I, I still, every now and then, I visit a blocker store because I think what is really nice is that a lot of the private label assortment that I selected is still there, so I apparently made the right choice. Um, but uh, I also see that, um, yeah, what we do within Amazon is that we really focus on the customer and, and do not look that much at, uh, let's say, competitors. Um, because we believe that if we have the, the inputs right for the business and the customers, then eventually, uh, yeah, we will make it happen. Okay. Yeah. And for this position, what made, what made you uh, interested in going to Amazon as opposed to other countries? Yeah, well, countries? the reason uh, actually that I switched from, um, let's say, brick and mortar retail to a pure player like Amazon was that I... Uh, I also, of course, uh, read a lot about uh, in the media or in um, uh, business magazine around, of course, the rise of e-commerce and that I thought like it would be nice to learn more about that. And I think then I thought like, okay, what is the best player to learn that? that that's probably Amazon. Um, and uh, so that is actually, I think, what was the reason why I applied um, and also I think because it was uh, like if I would apply, for instance, at Ball.com, which would have been easy because I had, of course, contacts there because via um, AO Deles. But what I really liked about Amazon that it was new in the Netherlands and that we were supposed to build something from scratch because, of course, there were some Dutch customers already shopping on Amazon in, in Germany. But for the majority, it, it was really a new player. Uh, and at the same time, you sort of worked in a scale-up, but you had the support of a super large company. So, for instance, if I had questions on, on how to do something, then I reached out to my counterparts in Germany and I asked them, like, hey, I have this problem, uh, what shall I do? So, um, yeah, it was sort of pioneering, but also with the support of a lot of teams worldwide um, on, on how to grow the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're currently the chief commercial officer of Amazon Benelux. Could you tell us a bit about what this position entails? Yeah, uh, well, it means that um, uh, within Amazon, uh, we are, of course, uh, active in a lot of other countries in, in Europe as well. Uh, so, for instance, when we, um, let's say, work with uh, manufacturers or other partners, we try to do it as much, much as possible on, the, on a European scale, so that we, for instance, do not talk with, um, for instance, uh, Unilever in each country independently, but that we really join forces and have sort of one conversation. Uh, so we do that in the Netherlands for a couple of uh, manufacturers, and then, for instance, in Germany, they do that for others. Um, and uh, what I'm doing is that I'm uh, responsible for, let's say, the assortment uh, so that customers have the best uh, experience in all the selection that we offer, uh, but also uh, in the customer experience. So um, I'm also very much involved in, okay, how can we improve the customer experience for, for Dutch customers? Uh, for instance, um, 
what we are in the beginning when we just launched, uh, it could take maybe five days before you received your parcel. Uh, and over time, we are now able that if you uh, order before 12, then you even get it the same day or at least the next day. So those type of um, delivery experiences, that is also part of my scope. And of course, I'm not doing this alone because we are with a management team where then my focus is mainly on uh, let's say the assortment, pricing, promotions, vendor relationships, and then other team members focus more, for instance, on the logistic, the operational side, um, and, and of course the, uh, someone else on, let's say, the marketing and, and prime activities. And yeah. throughout the, this process um, of building up also Amazon NL, what have been some challenges that you have encountered? Um, yeah, we had several uh, challenges because um, uh, we were the first marketplace in Europe uh, that went live with uh, 400 million articles. Uh, and as a comparison, an average online store usually has 10 million. So we had way, way more selection. But at the same time, we also, of course, wanted customers to be able to find what they are searching for. Um, and within Amazon, we work with sort of a learning algorithm. So with every search and that customers are looking for products, the site improves itself. But that means that in the beginning, uh, the experience was not good at all. So for instance, if you are uh, searching for, for instance, uh, a specific T-shirt, then you saw books or you saw toys or, or whatever. So it was, was really not working how it should, but also we did not have the right refinements that if you, for instance, wanted to search for bedding sheets, you could not choose whether you want one uh, for one bed or a double bed or a twin bed. So it's, it's like all these type of small things, like we launch a store, but <laughs> with a lot of paper cuts. And then the main focus of my team in the first year was really just making sure that everything was working well, that the checkout was working um, and, and yeah, all type of things. That we had the ideal payment method, which is the preferred payment method in the Netherlands. Um, and that we, and further we focused a lot of onboarding uh, new selection. And have you overcome many of these challenges now? Yeah, 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 no, over time. So a, a large challenge was indeed in the search and, and that really uh, has improved. Uh, we also had in the beginning some issues with the best before date that we found out that we shipped some expired products and then we discovered that it was related that uh, some of the selection was not all the attributes of the products uh, were not entered well and therefore it's, uh, yeah, it was not tracked in the fulfillment center and therefore we were shipping expired products, which was of course a very bad customer experience. So then we had to make sure that uh, all the FCs that they did bin checks and, and make sure that all the expiry dates were correct again. And so it's a lot of, yeah, back and uh, forth, back and and forth uh, solutions, hands on uh, to make sure that it, uh, it was solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now going from uh, customer experience more to your, your broader strategy, uh, we have found that uh, your strategy for breaking into new markets is uh, competing on price and through that trying to drive out competitors a bit. Um, is Amazon's end goal in the Benelux to be the market leader in the online retail sector? Well, I, I think that uh, what, what Amazon tries to offer to customers is, is that we, uh, as a customer that you know, if I go to Amazon, then I always have a good price. I do not have to check all competitor websites because with Amazon, you know, you always have a good price. So that is what we want to offer to our mm -hmm. customers. Um, and um, yeah, with that, I think in the Netherlands, there is still um, a lot of potential for more players. Like there, there is still so much um, yeah, room for competition that it, it's not our target to to be the number one or something. We are mm -hmm. just focusing on the customers and then seeing how we can, uh, yeah, improve that. Yeah. Um, and then are there 
are there any other sectors besides like online online retail that Amazon Benelux is now currently looking into expanding into? Um, well, outside of let's say our retail business, uh, Amazon already also, uh, is for I think around 10 years. We have an office here, and that is uh, AWS, mm -hmm. uh, and that is our um, uh, software uh, department within Am Amazon. So there we develop all kind of. Uh, uh, generatic e AI is of course a super um, important topic now that we are developing like long language modeling uh, but also basic software for companies where we help them with their IT infrastructure so that is a part of Amazon and that is um, I, I think there are 300 employees more or less in the Netherlands and they work for the EMEA region um, and then uh, we have, of course, also Prime Video, so that is our streaming service. Uh, and with that team, we also develop a lot of local content for the Netherlands, but also we look at um, uh, documentaries and, and, and series that are produced in other countries uh, by Amazon and that we then um, uh, use, uh, offer that for the Dutch customers as well. Um, yeah, so I think that are a bit, the, and uh, we are also, uh, of course, uh, a large advertising company, so that's also an area, mm -hmm. so there is more to, to retail uh, alone, yeah. Yeah, so Amazon is a, also a big overarching company doing a lot of different things when it, within it itself, so we were wondering, out of everything, what is the most profitable service that you offer currently in Amazon Benelux? Yeah, it, it, that's a bit difficult to say, because, um, for instance, you could say, advertising is profitable because they are basically printing money but they would not be able to do that if we hadn't our store so mm -hmm. uh, in the end you of course within a company you have a profit center and a loss center it depends on on where you are but you would not be in the able to do that without the other team mm -hmm. so it's it's not really that there is one area that, that is much more but the, is there a specific area that you, for example, is, are now working to further market for, to consumers and further expand then um, out of all these sectors? Um, well, yeah, for instance, let's say um, our AWS uh, software business is, let's say, more profitable than, than the retail business. But also there, it, 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 they would not have, let's say, all the resources to do their work without the, the, the retail side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, so for example, the retail and, and the online store is a big part uh, of Amazon itself. I think it's also how most consumers first were introduced to Amazon. Um, so could you briefly explain to us how exactly this marketplace, uh, marketplace works? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so within uh, the Amazon store, uh, we have, let's say, one part that is, uh, let's say, we call it the, the 1P or retail business. Uh, so that is actually what I'm responsible for. Uh, so there we really have our own assortment uh, in our own FCs uh, and we decide on the pricing. Uh, and then we have the side, and that's what we call our 3P or marketplace business. Uh, and that is where our sellers can uh, list uh, their own products and then they can decide if they want to use Amazon's fulfillment network or that they want to do it themselves directly to customers. Um, and um, I, I think the good thing is that within this model, it's an easy way to uh, increase your selection because uh, otherwise we would have need to have, let's say we have right now 700 million products uh, and if we would have to use that in our own FCs that would be of course um, yeah much much more work than than if we can have only let's say 50 percent more or less uh, retail and and then we have let's say the other half that is that is our marketplace and on the marketplace uh, that's also a very good entry position for small and medium-sized businesses because if you, for instance, are, have a small business in the Netherlands, you can list your products on Amazon NL, and via Amazon NL you can reach Europe and eventually even globally. So there are a lot of success stories of entrepreneurs who started in one marketplace and, and then were eventually able to sell globally via the Amazon fulfillment uh, systems. And um, can anyone become a vendor? You mentioned small businesses, but can anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are there any requirements to become a vendor? Uh, yes, you need to have a bank account, uh, <laughs> registration <laughs> at the c c Code of Commerce, or what's it called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are, of course, some prerequisites. And 
uh, if you start selling on Amazon and for instance, if you are constantly out of stock, then uh, you get, um, I think first an orange card or something. And if you are then really not constantly not providing a good experience, then you get a red flag and at a certain point it stops of course. But it's, it's really customer focused because we do, if you, for instance, as an entrepreneur, uh, get your product offline, then it's fine for us. But if you keep it there and it's not available, then it's yeah. it's a bad mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So going on to our uh, next questions, we first like, first like to do a, a bit of an audience survey. So show of hands, uh, who here has used Amazon in the past month? Okay, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who here has used Bol.com in the past month? Also quite a bit. Okay, okay. It seems a bit more for Amazon, actually. Um, but that's not what we've seen in the, in the Dutch market for now. Uh, I think it's probably also a bit related to the age group. Uh, because what we do see is that Amazon is especially large uh, among, actually, uh, foreign uh, foreigners in the Netherlands. Because we have the English language on our side, which uh, is helpful. Uh, but also uh, that we are especially younger groups uh, tend to yeah, be able to aware that Amazon exists in the Netherlands and there's still a lot of potential of, let's say, older people to, to realize that. Yeah, why do you think it, it is that Amazon has not been able to get a foothold after three years? Um, yeah, well, we started, uh, I think within three years, it's, it's already, already quite a lot what we accomplished because we have right now 4.6 million people shopping on Amazon. So if you look at the total population of, yeah, what is it, uh, 17, 18 million in the Netherlands, it's already almost one third. So yeah. I think that's quite a lot in, in three years. Yeah, well, but in other markets, we still see Am when Amazon, Amazon enters, they normally just dominate from the start, but it hasn't been. The case uh, yeah, I think that's that's a lot about the timing. Like for instance, in uh, when Amazon launched in in Germany, that was 22 years ago. Then they're basically they were the only one mm -hmm. uh, there. And of course, in the Netherlands, we were launched relatively late because we only started three years ago. Yeah. And therefore, we have already, of course, a very high bar in the Netherlands on, on online business. So there is a lot to choose from. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of different so it's, it's So it's a different entry point. Yeah. You really have to convince customers on why is it interesting to shop with Amazon. And how do you see a path forward to... Well, it's of course also a bit changing a habit because a lot of Dutch consumers, they have the, the apps on their phone and uh, of the different other uh, players in the Netherlands and, and they need to become familiar with Amazon because I also even anecdotally hear that sometimes consumer thinks that we are shipping from the US or something, but we actually have our own fulfillment center in the Netherlands and also an office in the Netherlands with employee, Dutch employee, or employees. So it's not that, um, yeah. We'll it, talk about this in a moment yeah. as well. <laughs> um, but first, we, were, we did some research and in 2002, there were actually talks of Amazon taking over bold.com. Um, and do you think your job would have been easier if they had done so back then? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's, um, uh, I think it's good f in the end for customers, if it's good if there is a lot to choose from and the market segment in the Netherlands is large enough for more mm -hmm. players. So, yeah. Okay. So not, they, not really. A if they had done so back then, who do you think would be the main competitor for Amazon now? You mean if they would, point, if so would not? Yeah. Well, I, I think still, um, uh, well, first of all, we are not competitor of, competitors obsessed. We are really customer obsessed. Yeah. So it's not, but of course we also look at, okay, well, what are others doing? And um, I think what is often a, a challenge is probably um, not per se everything stores, but for instance, if you look at uh, specific, uh, for instance, do-it-yourself platforms or, um, or uh, beauty websites, because they are really focusing on a very small segment, uh, they are often very good in having proper user videos, um, um, 
very good detail pages and, and, and all kind of things. So I can imagine that that's for customers. It's, it's really, I think, the challenge for Amazon because we have so much selection, how to have the best books experience and the best toys experience mm -hmm. when you are, uh, yeah, have so much selection. Do you think it's sometimes a hurdle that you have so much? I think it's sometimes a hurdle, yeah. That's mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, you can be the one stopping, one-stop shop destination, basically for everything, and you can. It's very easy if you can just buy everything in there, there. But um, at the same time, for us as uh, let's say the owners of the platform, it can be difficult to highlight which assortment because, for instance. Uh, we are globally also quite large in, well, for instance, musical instruments or specific automotive attributes. Uh, but how do you highlight that on a, yeah, on mm -hmm. a page when you have so much selection? Mm -hmm. And um, talking, bring back the topic you just mentioned previously about uh, Amazon also having its own vendors here, for example. We have a quick question for the audience again. Um, can anyone maybe guess, have a guess of where do they think that the primary vendors on Amazon and L are from? Yeah. No, what? It is Amazon and L, but where do you think um, these uh, markets are coming from, or shops? The Reynolds, no. It's actually not the main one. No. Any other guesses? <laughs> China, that's a bit closer. Correct, correct. So um, at the beginning of 2022, actually, only 2% of uh, Amazon NL's vendors actually came from the Netherlands, where we had around 60% from China and 11% uh, from Germany. Um, is that still the case today? Um, well, yeah, it, it's a bit uh, how you dependent how you look at it, uh, because as I said, for instance, uh, we collaborate a lot on the European level. So if you for instance, are um, working with a, a vendor like Procter & Gamble, uh, we are sharing within Europe uh, a European fulfillment network. So it can be that we, um, for instance, are buying from Germany and that we are s the German branch and then we are selling it in the Netherlands. But it doesn't mean that Procter & Gamble, we doesn't have a local relationship with mm -hmm. them. So, um, yeah, so it's it's... It what about China? Has it always been a very active player? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, especially on our marketplace, uh, I think there we have a very a lot of uh, also successful uh, sellers from China. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I, we of course at Amazon do a lot of checks on whether the products are compliant and, and things like that. Uh, and then I think it's 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 good that we. Yeah, have that available for customers. But would this be something that you'd like to address um, in Vanilux? Would you like to encourage more Dutch vendors and more local vendors to um, join? Yeah, well, well, what we do is, and that is also related to the example that I just mentioned, uh, we have quite a lot of um, yeah, seminars for entrepreneurs and smaller businesses to list their selection on Amazon because really believe in, we believe in the model that if they list in the Netherlands and then expand to Europe, so... Uh, that is definitely something that we stimulate to, uh, yeah, to grow, let's say, the small businesses in the Netherlands. Uh, but also, uh, for instance, uh, brands like, um, uh, yeah, typical. And well, an example, for instance, is also Unilever. They are, of course, a, a European brand, but they have local jewels. How they call it, like Andre Dove, and and that are is selection that is only, uh, yeah, Dutch customers buy that. Mm -hmm. So then we have that in the Netherlands specifically. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and in our research, we also found uh, on the Financial Dagblad, we found an article uh, about Dutch vendors complaining about uh, unreachable customer service because you're an American company and it's, it's hard uh, to get through to customer service uh, compared to bold.com, for example. Is that something you're looking to improve to maybe um, get more Dutch vendors? Well, I don't uh, really recognize that because we have a very large customer service team actually in The Hague, uh, and uh, they are answering uh, yeah uh, all day questions from customers. And 
ideally, I also think the best service is no customer service. So of course, they should only reach out if, if there is really an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the same, so that is more from a consumer perspective. So we have a, a local uh, in The Hague, an office, uh, our own customer service. And at the same time for vendors, uh, because we are so large and we have so much selection, um, there are a lot of manufacturers that we manage, we call it hands of the wheel. So they are completely self-service. Uh, we have a lot of uh, online education for these uh, manufacturers, how to list their selection, how to run advertising with their selection, how to do promotions. And if they have a problem, then they can raise a ticket and then this ticket is, is answered. Uh, that is how we work with the majority of, of our, uh, let's say, uh, manufacturers. But there is, uh, let's say, a smaller group, and that is what we call uh, tier one vendors, and that are really, of course, the large ones like the Philips, Sony, Apple, etc. Yes. Uh, with those, uh, we do have a direct relationship. So if they have a question, then the next day they have an answer. But if you are more on the self-service, then, uh, yeah, it's really that you have to be, uh, because it's, of course, for us not possible to have a direct relationship mm -hmm. with everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, but still, is it because a uh, bol.com, for example, is, of course, Dutch, and it's, of course, more local, um, and there are a lot of smaller vendors who, who feel some issue with, uh, with having such unreachable uh, relations. For example, is that is that not something you want to work on? Um, well, yeah, we, we improve things every day. So if we, for instance, signal that there are, let's say, uh, a lot of um, smaller sellers having difficulties, for instance, with listing selection, then we, uh, yeah, start to make a program on, on how we can improve that. Yeah. yeah. So now looking to your bigger brother in the US, uh, Amazon US has been creating an omni-channel approach, for example, by uh, buying up the Whole Foods grocery store uh, for, to be able to reach every customer. Uh, is the omni-channel approach also something you're looking to do in Amazon Benelux? Um, well, personally, I would like it because I, I really like also the, yeah, the combination of physical stores, online stores, and I think both have their unique um, added value for customers. Um, but uh, so far, I'm not aware of any plans that, that we will get here stores as, as well. So yeah. we cannot expect uh, over, uh, Amazon to take over uh, Jumbo, for example, anytime soon. Not that I am aware of, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so now let's have some audience questions. Is the mic ready? Uh, so if you want to raise an audience question, please raise your hand and we'll get to you. Anybody? Oh. Yeah. The guy in the blue sweater. No. Yeah, um, you mentioned that Amazon is not focused on competition, but in the EU they have been stri striked with several lawsuits against anti-competitive behavior, mostly between first-party products and third-party products on your platform. So, w what's up with that? Yes, um, well, there is actually, uh, of course, an ongoing uh, sort of um, that there will be more and more regulation, of course, on, on the European level. And we are very much, uh, of course, looking into that. Like there, it's not only in the area what you are just mentioning, but for instance, also that we get more and more taxes on, for instance, uh, bottle deposits, sugar taxes, uh, and, and all kind of stuff. So we have to be very closely monitoring the regulation to, to adjust for it. Um, and uh, on this, spe this specific part um, is that um, um, we, uh, for instance, what I was just saying is that I am really responsible for the 1P and the retail business, uh, and I don't have visibility, for instance, on the details of the, our marketplace third-party business. So there's within the company really sort of a Chinese wall. So I don't have access to the data of specific sellers on Amazon. So that is that is strictly separated, and we also have a lot of internal trainings around this that um, I'm not supposed to share information from uh, 1P with my colleagues that are working on 3P. 
so there are very strict rules and regulations around that. Uh, so I think that um, yeah, we are yeah, doing everything we can to, to keep it separate. Uh, at the same time, I think um, uh, what they are saying, for instance, is that we are trying to make our own private label on products that are selling well, for instance, on uh, at third party players. Well, as I just shared, we don't, I don't have visibility on the data because I, I cannot see what is selling well. I only see total numbers, so I do see the total amount, but not the, the detailed granularity. Um, and um, I think that is, uh, that on the private label piece, that is, for instance, something that uh, Albert Hein, where I worked, is doing, uh, every retailer does that. So, for instance, uh, that if you uh, see like, uh, okay, we have, um, uh, for instance, um, customers are buying a lot of iced tea, let's make a private label iced tea. Customers are buying a lot of toilet paper, let's make private label toilet paper. So uh, having private brands and A brands in the combination, I think for customers it's good that they have, the, have multiple alternatives and, and can choose but from, uh, let's say, data insights that, that's really separated within Amazon, yeah. Uh, so it, it's still, I think, uh, th th there is no final outcome on, on that one yet, yeah. Yes, so we'll take one more question that I believe the first row had. Uh, yeah, so I have one question regarding the third-party sellers you have on your platform. Um, so how does Amazon, from a point of like strategy, for example, view those sellers in comparison to themselves? So what you said is that uh, with uh, taking a private, if uh, something's very popular, do you see those sellers mostly as uh, a competition or is it mostly like an addition to the platform where you are uh, like, oh yeah, because the margins on selling the product yourself is probably bigger than having a third party seller and you take a part of the profit probably, right? Um, so how do you view that within the company? That's yeah, the um, well, it, it's not necessarily that when we do it ourselves, it's more profitable because if they uh, are selling it themselves, they have their own, uh, we don't store their product, so it's no impact on our working capital. Um, and then uh, they only pay us a fee to list their product. So it, it's actually um, a profitable uh, business, I would say. Um, but um, yeah, we actually, um, we started with the sellers on our marketplace because we really believe that with that we can accelerate our selection. And the Amazon flywheel works with the fact that by having um, uh, as much selection as possible, we get as ma much customers as possible and then it will eventually be better for, for everyone. So we really stimulate um, our marketplace sellers and we also provide them, they have access to a lot of data around their brands uh, so that they can further optimize it. Um, so it's, um, there, it's, it's not really competition for us. It's, it's just, we, I think it can exist very well next to each other because it's, it's just increasing the, the size of the selection. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now moving from the more market-based of strategies that we were discussing to another big topic that I think Amazon is also very much aware of and it's very popular nowadays about sustainability. So essentially Amazon's business model as we gather is trying to make sure customers also pay as little as possible, have a wide range of goods, but this also promotes a lot of consumerism. So in your view, is this sustainable? Um. Well, I, I think in, in principle, of course, over-consumerism is, is, is not good for the planet. But um, I think what we do with Amazon is that um, because we are such a large com company, we also realize we have a broad responsibility. Um, and, and that means that, for instance, um, Amazon committed to uh, be uh, compliant to the Climate Act in, in Paris already ten, year, 10 years earlier. Uh, and what we are, for instance, planning to do is that by 2025, we will be, um, uh, yeah, fully, um, how do you call it? Uh, without Renewable energy? Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of uh, wind energy, solar energy, and we are actually on track. So I think that by 2025, we will meet that target. Uh, and another one uh, that is also super important uh, is that we 
uh, try to minimize uh, our um, carton uh, that we use. So for instance, what we now have in Europe is that all the carton boxes that we use are recycled. Uh, and I think with a large company like Amazon, if with all these initiatives um, added together, you can have a large, very large impact. Um, right, and yeah, we'll also discuss these uh, climate goals that Amazon is setting to achieve as well in a bit. But first, looking into the specifics, we talked a lot about vendors and retailers. retailers. So we were wondering, does Amazon, for example, have any specific guidelines on the sustainability of the products that it offers on the website? Yeah, well, what we have is, uh, within that um, is that uh, it's not yet live in the Netherlands. Uh, we will have it next year. Uh, but it already exists in Europe and in the US, and uh, that's what we call the climate pledge. Uh, and that means that we have a collaboration with a lot of uh, manufacturers where we really highlight uh, uh, their products with a specific badge on the detail base, base to stimulate customers to make conscious choices about what they are buying, what are the best uh, products that have the least impact on the, on the environment. So, uh, we read as well, you have this little climate badge that will be present when buying products, but will you also sell them the products that do not have the climate uh, badge as well? Yes, yeah. Um, and will there be any, uh, for example, marketing strategy also to promote um, those goods with the climate badge or? Yes, no, definitely. We, uh, th that's why we are, are going to highlight it in specific stores so that, so that, uh, or detailed pages so that it's super visible for the customers. Um, and well, this is one aspect of, I think, the broader topic of sustainability. Um, along those lines, you, want, you have a lot of main goals. Um, and on the website, for example, you have the goal of lower prices, better selection, more convenience, faster deliveries, along with attainable ethical and sustainability, sustainability practices. How are you able to do it all? Yeah, I think, well, that's why there work a lot of people uh, at Amazon. So, uh, for instance, uh, let's say the initiative that I just mentioned around um, uh, the carton boxes, that is then, of course, one team that is really dedicated and focused on reducing all the waste in prep prepping material, but also to make sure then that we have this initiative. And there, uh, f another initiative is that we, for instance, uh, will start with uh, bicycle delivery in Amsterdam and Rotterdam next year. So yeah, it's just every team has their own, let's say, deliverables to go step by step and, and improve this. And for instance, my team is very much involved in connecting all the manufacturers to this climate pledge uh, friendly um, initiative. Um, and so will we uh, see then lots of bikes with Amazon packages and parcels? And there also talks about drones, but no drones yet? Well, I, th I think the drones, that's especially interesting in, in very remote areas in the US. I think mm -hmm. that's not really something <laughs> for the Benelux. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about sustainability again, is it, is it hard to ensure quality, affordability, and sustainability uh, of the product, especially with different vendors uh, all having very diverse range, range of products. Is that hard? Or? Yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely a challenge, but um, there we can also use the, the scale of Amazon um, because uh, for us, uh, because we are such a large company, it's probably also maybe more easy to invest a lot in, uh, for instance, uh, electric trucks, electric uh, vans, uh, bicycles, uh, but also we did a very large investment in a seaweed farm here in the in front of the in the North Sea, um, because we really believe in in those type of initiatives, uh, and we do that because it's not only um, our consumers who want this, but also our employees. So there is are a lot of internal so. Uh, communities of employees who constantly come up with ideas to, to further improve uh, and reduce the footprint of, of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And as you touched upon previously, you have the goal by 2025 to be 100% uh, renewable energy and by 2040 to have net zero. Um, 
this is a broad goal, but what are also some maybe concrete steps that you can share that is being done to achieve this yeah. right now? Yeah, so the, the small step is then uh, already, uh, of course, that we have the, the completely recycled carts and boxes that is now in Europe. Uh, the small step is next year that we will have electric vehicles or electric bikes in the, in the, at the Netherlands in the larger cities. Uh, we are also working on uh, lockers, so that's uh, because we also have done multiple research that that also is better for the environment and actually a lot of customers like it, that you can have a fixed locker and that, that is then where you uh, will receive your parcel so that the last mile delivery, um, of course, impact uh, reduces. Uh, and so there is actually a complete roadmap of different uh, steps that, that we are taking to make sure that we can reach that goal in 2020, 30. Uh, will this be something shared online or not yet, these, the roadmap? Uh, well, Amazon in that sense is different than the companies I worked for because there they usually said, we are going to do this. And then they were actually not sure yet that they were <laughs> going to do it. But within Amazon, they are always very hesitant to share if they are not 100% sure that it's going to happen. So that's uh, probably why we always, um, well, we, of course, we um, committed ourselves to the 2030 target and that we will meet that. But for instance, we will uh, not share what we are going to do in two years because we will announce it when it's ready. So for instance, now we know, okay, we have, um, we can share that we have the, for instance, the cards and boxes across Europe, that it's recyclable and then we share it. So always so a very short notice. But can we hold, for example, Amazon accountable to reaching net zero uh, by the targets? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, we are super far uh, with that already. So that's, um, and finally, on, on this round as well, on Amazon's website is often mentioned that uh, sustainability focuses on enhancing energy, as you mentioned, renewable sources, reducing carbon, um, and driving a circular economy. What does a circular economy look like for yeah. Amazon Benelux? Well, what we are offering already uh, on our site are uh, second-hand products, um, refurbished products. Uh, when, uh, for instance, we receive customer returns, we check whether we can still resell it, um, so, or, or uh, if it's the questionable, then, then of course we cannot, uh, but otherwise uh, we always sell it again. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are also donating a lot of products. So if a box is open, but nothing is wrong with it, then we, for instance, donate it to War Child or other charity initiatives. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the Amazon Second Chance uh, page. Uh, this is not very known, at least to us. Um, so is Amazon actively marketing this and how are well, you Well, that is actually a constant uh, challenge with a lot of initiatives that we have is because there is so much that we want to display on our um, gateway page, our home page, mm -hmm. uh, is that it's very difficult sometimes to make these initiatives visible. And I think that is definitely something that we can improve because there is, is a lot that, that we are doing there. Yeah. yeah. Well, how many people are using this service right now? Do you know? Uh, well, we do sell a lot of second-hand products, yes, especially in electronics, because it's a better price mm -hmm. and, and we guarantee that it's still good, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so in the, few, in the coming few years, can we see it also, like, uh, further expand, for example, Amazon second-hand, the, the second-chance market? Yes? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and that is actually also part of the European uh, regulation that is upcoming, mm -hmm. that if you are, uh, that as a retailer, you also need to take responsibility on making sure that, um, yeah, that products, uh, that, they, uh, that they can be repaired or renewed or, or re so that's, um, yeah, and it, it's not only that Amazon is actually already doing it, but it's also will become European regulation in a few years, yeah. Mm -hmm. So taking it back to the theme of our career week, uh, it, the theme is progress. So we'd like to ask you, what are some goals that you would like to have achieved at the end of your tenure as CCO? Um, well, actually, my end is already tomorrow because I'm switching to a different role within Amazon. Um, uh, because I will, I, right now I'm commercially responsible, but uh, from Monday uh, I will be responsible for the Prime and marketing program in the, Net in the Benelux, the Nordics, and, and Poland. 
So a nice new challenge, again in a different field, and that's actually what I would recommend all of you in your career, just try out many things. There are so much out there that that is nice, and you can always transfer your skills in different areas. Uh, well, I think what I'm proud of what I accomplished in, in the best last three and a half years in, in Amazon is that I built a really nice, diverse international team in the Netherlands, where we uh, yeah, on board a lot of new manufacturers and uh, we, uh, well, as I shared, we are almost uh, having five million uh, Dutch customers shopping with us, which is a great uh, accomplishment. Um, and um, yeah, so I, th I, th I think that's that's really nice what we achieved, and, and there are still a lot of new challenges uh, to do, uh, because I think there's yeah still much more potential in in the, in the Dutch market. But uh, yeah, um, so and no, sorry. so going to your next uh, position, what, what will be some of your goals there? Uh, yeah, in my next uh, position, um, because um, within Amazon uh, Europe, we look at sort of, we have a sort of split within between the more established marketplaces. So that's, uh, for instance, Germany, the UK, where Amazon has been present for already 20 years. And then my focus will be on the emerging markets. So that's then uh, companies where Amazon recently launched. Uh, and the challenge there is really in, in uh, yeah, building, creating awareness for, for the Amazon store, creating a, a loyal customer base, um, and uh, yeah, make sure that they like to shop with us and uh, that they um, keep coming back. So that, that will be my, so it's more really a loyalty uh, focus that I'm, um, that's, that will be my main goal. And um, looking overall at this experience so far, that you've been Amazon for like three years now, um, would you say that Amazon Benelux has been successful? Yes, I think so, uh, because it's, um, uh, of course, we had already some Dutch consumers who were shopping on Amazon in Germany, um, or even the US, uh, but still I think uh, not being present in the Netherlands with a real own store, um, I think, uh, yeah, that, that really helped in, in, yeah, growing the awareness for Amazon NL, having more specific local NL selection, um, and, uh, yeah, being closer to the customer. Um, so finally, moving to some concluding questions that we have. Um, just looking back, what would have been one thing you would have liked to know before joining Amazon? Mm. Good question, let me think. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that, um, uh, well, what can sometimes be a challenge, it's a good thing and, and sometimes also can be challenging, is that literally we are over obsessed on, on data and that's of course something that, that I knew, but um, I think not always everything can be measured. So, um, uh, and and since we usually only invest in um, in in topics when it's really, um, yeah, data driven, when we really know that what the outcome will be, or we are high confidence and we can track everything, and that makes it, for instance, sometimes for us a, a challenge in, uh, for instance, emerging markets that I just mentioned. Uh, like, how do you measure? Uh, properly all the different marketing activities that you are doing uh, because sometimes you have to um, uh, do multiple things in a row uh, before you really trigger a customer to shop on Amazon and I think that is sometimes a challenge in, in the whole culture where everything needs to be tracked immediately and um, yeah to, to get um, everyone's uh, yeah that everyone is supportive. Mm -hmm. And what is something in your opinion that makes Amazon stand out? Um, well, I think where Amazon stands out, I think, is in uh, really how they are um, really um, inno inno yeah, innovative on behalf of the customer, but also how they raise the bar uh, across each other. So it, it's really like with everything they, they do, you're really stimulated to further improve it. And that, that's really an ongoing culture. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, that, that's really, it's in the Netherlands, we sometimes call it the sixes culture that, oh, it, it's good as it is now, but here we really always try to, try to improve. And that, that's a constant, 
um, mindset, I think it's really nice to, to work with, yeah. And uh, finally, what would be a piece of advice that you could share to us, to the students here, who, who would maybe someday like to end up in your position? Yeah. Um, well, I think during your career, um, I, I think what's really um, has been sort of all through my career is that I just, I'm very uh, curious to learn field new things. And um, yeah, if you have that, then I think it's really nice uh, to work also in, in larger companies where you can really do a lot of different things. Um, and um, if you are at a certain point feel like, oh, I, I'm confident now, then switch to something new, do something out of the box, and that keeps you really engaged and um, uh, yeah, throughout your career, because it's, uh, you should enjoy your work. You should not be, I just go somewhere and, oh, is it time already? I can go. Because it's, you spend so much of your life. Like, for instance, I work full time and um, I also have a family. Um, and I wouldn't want to spend um, a lot of my time uh, on this job if I didn't like it. So make sure that you really like what you do. And also sometimes, um, I also know it with some employee, with some colleagues, also, don't be impatient. Like sometimes it takes a little bit, and then you will eventually find something new and, and that you like. Yeah. Thank with you. that note, um, we would like to thank you very much for joining us today and finding the time to speak with us. And also, we'd like to thank everyone here today and uh, for coming and spending also your time listening. Um, if you have any more questions, I think you can approach us after the interview itself. But that said, thank you all so much. Let's give a round of applause for Michelle. And um, on that note, we'd also like to share some upcoming interviews that Room for Discussion will be hosting, and this is a handful, uh, especially in the coming week. So next Wednesday, we'll have a prominent scholar on populism in the far right, Kas Mude, uh, joining us on stage from 1 to 2 p.m. So there's that one. And for those who are more interested in finance, we have on December 8th, which is next Friday, uh, the CEO of Flow Traders uh, joining us on stage to, to discuss also different aspects of global major financial markets. So uh, if you're interested, we hope to see you there. And if you're interested in the other interviews we'll be having, please check out our website. On yeah. that note, thank you all for coming. Yeah.